High school friends David Pakaus and Ephraim Deveroli both dropped out of school to become illegal arms dealers for the United States military. The two saw an opportunity to make money by bidding on government weapons contracts, even though they have no experience or knowledge in weapons manufacturing. The pair managed to secure a $300 million contract from the Pentagon to supply U.S. troops in the war in Afghanistan. The only problem is that they have no way to fulfill the requirements of the contract. Acting in desperation, the boys must meet with shady Soviet generals and destructive warlords in an attempt to purchase a large amount of weapons, putting themselves in a world of trouble in the process. The movie begins with scenes from January 1st, 2008, when some kidnappers park their car somewhere around an abandoned building. They pull David out and ask him something in the Albanian language, which he cannot understand. He begs them to let him go, but suddenly, a man points his pistol at him. Now, the story starts back in Miami in 2005 with the narration of David, when he used to be a professional masseur, charging $75 an hour. He quits his job after a disgusting act from one of his clients, when the client drops his towel intentionally. He starts selling bedsheets, but he also leaves that job when he does not get many buyers. He quit or got fired from six different jobs in that short time frame. One day, he goes to the funeral of a high school friend and meets another one of his old school friends, Ephraim. Ephraim just moved to Miami to start his own arms dealing business. He tells David that he buys seized weapons at police auctions and resells them on the internet, which impresses David. The next day, he is out trying to sell bedsheets, but is refused by all his potential customers. Feeling discouraged, David decides to visit Ephraim's office in Miami. He again gets surprised watching him making an arms deal sale on the phone. Ephraim's strategy is to impersonate an army officer on the phone to find out the competition on the government contracts. David asks him how it works, and Ephraim shows him a public website of the government containing every military contract for bidding. He tells him to ignore the giant projects and look for the smaller ones. Because of those little contracts, everyone ignores them. He teaches him how a minor contract can earn him millions. After that, David comes home, where his wife informs him that she is pregnant. This freaks him out, thinking he is not yet ready to raise a child. So he meets Ephraim the following day. Watching him worry about his financial conditions, Ephraim asks David if he wants to join him in his arms dealing business, because he's the only one he can trust. David replied, saying he understood nothing about his business, and tells him that he and his wife are against the war, so she will not let him do this business. But Ephraim talks about how much money he will make, which changes his mind, and convinces him to join the business. David comes home and lies to his wife, telling her that he is starting his new business to sell bedsheets to the US Army in Iraq. She agrees and likes his business idea. Now both friends help each other expand the business and scout the government website for small overlooked arms deals. They create relationships with the weapon manufacturers and contractors of Europe. The contractors call them war dogs and bottom feeders who make money from war without fighting on the battlefield. One day, David manages to contact the largest weapon supplier named Henry Girard who agrees to do business with them. They go out to dinner to celebrate when they receive a call from one of their clients, Captain Santos. He confirms a Beretta pistol deal of $600,000. He calls him again the next day and tells him that he is worried about the new legislation in Italy, which means he cannot send the Beretta pistols directly from Italy to Iraq as originally planned. David wasn't aware of this legislation, but he kept lying, assuring the client of the shipments. He rushes to Ephraim and tells him everything about the deal. He explains his plan to ship the pistols from Italy to Jordan, and then they can send them to Iraq. They agreed on this plan and left. At night, Ephraim comes to his home and calls him out. He tells him that the Jordanian customs have seized the Berettas. At that exact moment, Captain Santos calls him from Baghdad. He demands an explanation for all this weapon seizure and threatens to cancel the order. Getting canceled would mean the end of David and Ephraim's business. If this happens, their company will be blacklisted and they won't get a contract ever again. David's wife overhears their conversation. Now she demands an explanation from her husband, finding him lying to her. She yells at him saying that she cannot trust him anymore. Ephraim interrupts them and asks David to get ready to go to Jordan immediately. When they got there, the US Embassy did not help them deal with the Jordan customs, so they took matters into their own hands. They bribed the locals to help them release their cargo, and they successfully do so in three days. They hired a local driver named Marlboro to take the shipment from Jordan to the American base. In the middle of the night, they arrive at the Iraq border, where some military men stop them. They ask the driver about his load and the Americans on the seats, to which he replies, they are businessmen in Baghdad. The driver, Marlboro, now gives them the packs of Marlboro cigarettes as a bribe. After that, they allow them to pass with no issues. They travel all night and stop in the morning at the Anmar province of Iraq. Marlboro refills his gas can from the destroyed gas station. Suddenly, David sees some militants coming towards them from behind the truck. He calls Ephraim and their driver, Marlboro. 
Ephraim quickly gets back on the truck and struggles to start because almost nothing is in the gas tank. They cannot wait for Marlboro. So they made him run after the truck until he came close enough to jump into the back truck. He fills the tank as they move. The militants start shooting at them, but they see them suddenly stop. The American army actually saves them. After that, they make it to the American base without any issues. Captain Santos orders them to pay them the cash, and they leave Iraq afterward. This deal put them on the map, and the company keeps growing. They were getting more and more money every day. They buy matching Porsches and two apartments in the same building. So Ephraim expands the company, hiring more employees to work for them and finding them more deals. One night, David sees the Pentagon has posted an Afghan deal. It was a huge contract that included 100 million rounds of AK-47 ammunition. So they travel to Nevada and go to Vegas X, a convention where manufacturers show off their latest in warfare. There, they find out that they cannot land this Afghan deal due to insufficient logistical support. After some time, they meet Henry Girard, a legendary arms dealer at Vegas X. He assures them that he can fill the whole order because of his contacts in Albania. His help sounds too good to be true to them. So Ephraim wonders why Henry isn't bidding on the contract himself. Henry confesses that he is barred from doing business with the US government because he is on a terror watch list. This worries David, who freaks out and doesn't want to work with such a type of person. But Ephraim points out that this is exactly the kind of people they've been buying from and selling guns to. He tells them that the Pentagon cannot work with these guys, but they can. So eventually, they end up accepting the deal on the condition of seeing the merchandise first. Henry approves them. A few days later, they both flew to Albania to check on the cargo. They arrive at their warehouse. They test AK-47 ammo and the bullets and confirm. So they fly back to Miami and make their bid. They won the deal after five months and rejoiced over it. When David returns home, he tells his wife he'll be leaving for Albania for a month, but she tells him that she found his pictures of Iraq and his lies. Trying to calm her down, David swears that this is the last thing he's lied about. But then his wife reveals she knows about something else too, some bags of money he had hidden under the sink without telling her. Seeing that he can't stop lying, his wife leaves with the baby. In the next scene, David goes to Albania to move their shipment of the AK-47 ammo. While getting their cargo ready, David discovers they got played, and the bullets are actually Chinese, which makes them illegal due to a US embargo on them. David and Ephraim call Henry, who tells them this is their problem now, and they should have checked every crate before buying. After some days, Ephraim shows up at his hotel and explains an idea to him. He plans to repack the bullets. He said without their original crates, the US would never know their country of origin. Their plan worked, and on December 8, 2007, they delivered their first 5 million rounds to the Afghan army without any issue. In the middle of the shipments, Ephraim calls from America to tell David that Henry has charged them a 400% markup, and he wants him out of the deal for ripping them off. Henry immediately tries to stop him, because Henry is not the type of guy to mess around with, as he's already on the terror watch list. They are making a tremendous amount of money anyway, so he asks Ephraim to stop sabotaging the whole operation. He tells him that he found that deer and let him handle it. David lashes out at him, saying he has been working very hard in Albania away from his family while he is comfortable in America. Ephraim assures him of understanding the situation and promises not to do anything, but he walks to David's office and steals the signed agreement from David's desk. Later that night, David is kidnapped from his apartment and taken to the middle of an abandoned area. Now, the story returns from where the movie started. Two kidnappers beat him up, and Henry threatens him with a gun, warning him they can't cut him out of his own deal before leaving. Now scared, David decides to return to Miami, so he goes to the warehouse to pick up his things and papers. The repacking contractor, Enver, tells him that he has never been paid, and that he wants to know the real reason why they want to repack the ammo. He said he was also angry because Ephraim had not picked up the phone. David tells him that he is going to Miami and promises to send him the money when he arrives there. He assures them that he'll be back in a week. He thinks to himself that he's never going back to Albania. The first thing he does when he gets to Miami is to see his wife and confess every single illegal activity he has committed for the company. She takes him back when he says he'll quit the arms dealing business and become a massage therapist again. After that, he goes to Ephraim to tell him he is quitting and demand his $4 million from the deal. Ephraim refuses to pay him. Then David tells him he'll send a lawyer if he doesn't get his money in two weeks. But Ephraim is not worried because he's destroyed the only copy of their signed agreement. When David discovers this, he reacts with anger and leaves. After some time, one of Ephraim's friends, Ralph, approached David and offered himself as a mediator between the two friends. He agrees and they meet at breakfast, where Ephraim apologizes and offers David 200 grand, which is, of course, a laughable number for him. David gets angry and starts telling Ralph all the illegal things they did with his funding and how they pay him less than what they actually make. David also points out that he has proof of everything in his laptop, so he could quickly bring Ephraim down if he wanted. But Ephraim warned David that he would go down too if he told anyone anything. 
Because he also had got his name on all the paperwork, the meeting ends without them reaching an agreement. Shortly after that, David gets a call from the New York Times asking him for an interview about the repacked Chinese AK-47 ammo. He gets apprehensive after this call. He meets with Ephraim and talks about the call from the journalist. Ephraim tries to make him feel sorry for him while acting as a good old best friend. So David punches him, saying that he played him. When the elevator comes down to the first floor, they find themselves surrounded by the FBI who immediately arrest them. The mistake that led to them being arrested was not paying Enver, who called the Pentagon and told them about the repackaging of the ammo. The government launched a full-scale investigation, and the meeting with Ralph was a setup. He wore a microphone during the whole conversation to record them confessing their crimes. Ephraim was sentenced to four years in prison, while David was sentenced to house arrest for seven months. The movie ends when David goes to his massage center after his house arrest. He is shocked to see Henry as his client. Since he gets scared, Henry promises that it's okay, because if he wanted him dead, he would already be dead. He apologized to him for kidnapping him in Albania. David has some questions for Henry, but instead of answering, Henry offers him a suitcase full of money if he promises not to ask any more questions.